everybody, Bongi and Demo, and I'm back again with a quantity once in my mobile. See, I said it there, yes, to custom be on Thank you very much, guys, for those who supported me, for those who added on to my vocabulary, for those who rebuked me. I love y'all. Uh, I'm back again with another topic, but I'm still prevailing under the premise that the Abogusi are a lost tribe of Israel, and the Abogusi language, the Ekegusi language, is a progenitor biblical language. And in fact, the Ekegusi language was one of the contributing languages that made up the Hebraic lingua franca that's used today in Israel. Um, and really, uh, many people don't know this, but the Hebrew language is indeed a Bantu language. And I argue that it is a Bantu language. Now, our topic today is a pretty simple subject, um, but it is also a contentious subject among some biblical scholars. On to what the Ekegusi Hebrew language uh, brings on and adds on to the concept of Nazareth or the meaning of Nazareth. And in so doing, the purpose of talking about this is so that we can find out what the real meaning of the name Nazareth is. And by that, we'll find out who this Jesus of Nazareth is. Who is Jesus of Nazareth? Why is he called Nazareth? The reason there seems to be a push and pull uh, among some biblical scholars about Nazareth, and some of them don't, can't quite agree or come to a conclusion why he's called Jesus of Nazareth um, is because there's no mention of Nazareth in the Old Testament by the prophets. However, in the New Testament, they do talk about Jesus of Nazareth, and in fact they say that he shall be called a Nazarene to fulfill the prophecy. Well, my research shows there seems to be a greater inclination towards Jesus being called Jesus of Nazareth because he grew up in Nazareth. Now, some scholars wonder, you know, you know, why is he called Jesus of Nazareth? I mean, in Matthew 2.23, it talks about Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph, and Nathaniel asks, can anything good come out of Nazareth? And um, in the book of Luke, um, it talks about, you know, Joseph, uh, changing his mind about going into Judea because he was trying to avoid um, Herod's progeny. Um, so he decides to take Jesus into hiding and, and secretly, um, you know, raise him in Nazareth. But some scholars are debating about the subject of Nazareth. Why, why, why Jesus of Nazareth? Why not Jesus of Bethlehem? Or why not Jesus of Galilee? Why Nazareth? Um, some scholars seem to go with the paradigm that Jesus is called Jesus of Nazareth because he took a Nazarite vow. Now, we have no mention of Jesus take, ever taking a Nazarite vow. Um, secondly, Jesus uh, came close to breaking his vow if he had taken one because he hung around dead bodies. He raised the girl from the dead that he told Talita Kum. And then he hung around prostitutes and drunkards, you know, the whole shebang. Um, so there's that debate of where does this Nazarene, uh, Nazarene concept come from? Well, I have... Um, I seem to incline of my research shows and using that cultural Afro-Asiatic thinking, um, the name Nazareth may have its roots from two points. Uh, one, I believe, is because Jesus was raised in Nazareth. However, my primal or my most uh, I'm compelled to believe that the most fundamental reason he was called Jesus of Nazareth is because he acquired the name, the Nazarene or Nazareth, as a child because of where he was born in Bethlehem. And I'll explain this later. Okay, so, touch of trying to find out what Nazareth means, I've come across two, two roots, uh, two main roots, which is Nazar with an S and Nazar with a Z. 
and the Nisar has two roots and uh, two roots uh, that have kind of two different meanings and Nazar is a different root okay so then we have um, Nazar, Nazar or Nazar in the Hebrew every language in the Hebrew that's spoken now in Israel um, it means to consecrate or separate oneself and then you have Nazir a concentrated a consecrated one sorry or a Nazarite and then you have Nazir and this is a reference to the book of Genesis 49 22 when Jacob blesses Joseph and tells him Joseph is a fruitful plant whose branches run over a wall and he shall be Nazir to his brothers and then you have Nasar meaning to watch to guard to keep to watch as in a watchtower sorry or a sentinel and then you have Nasirim, a watchman. And then you have Nasir, which is N S Y R, uh, I believe is really the equivalent for the Luo name Nasiri, uh, meaning uh, the preserved or to keep guard, meaning the preserved, to keep guard with secrets, uh, closed, besieged, blocked, or blockaded. And then you have the second kind of Nasar that has to do with to be fresh to be bright, grow, green, or a branch, okay? So we have various meanings or various implications to the root of Nazareth. Okay, so now, the first part, you know, I feel like the Hebrew language, you know, some scholars tend to explain the concept of Nazir when, when you know, Jacob blesses Joseph and he tells him, Joseph is a fruitful plant whose branches run over a wall and shall be a Nazir to his brothers. Many people seem, uh, you know, scholars seem to imply that Nazir means a branch because of the concept of a wall. However, just using my Afro-Asiatic derivation, Nazir to me, in fact, using the imagination of the branches going over a wall seems to imply, you know, something that's moving out of its form, you know, stretching over. So to me, Nazir is equivalent to the Swahili word, Wazir, meaning a minister, you know, somebody who is assigned with a political role uh, and has, you know, subjects under him, or a minister in terms of the gospel, or an ambassador in terms of both socio-political, religious, and both political. So to me, I, I feel the word Nazir means an ambassador or a minister and not really a branch as per, you know, the denotative imagination that people want to use. Okay, and then you have, uh, but if you look through the, you know, the, the every Hebrew explanation uh, that has to do with Nazar, Nazar, to consecrate oneself, it's pretty similar to the concept of NSYR Nasir, or Nasir to me, meaning the reserve or to keep guard or a secret. The Swahili word, you know, the Swahili word for secret is Siri. Nasir, meaning secret. Now, when somebody is considered to be of a priestly function and he's not going to get married, he becomes consecrated in, in the sense that he becomes you know, blockaded away from society. He becomes, you know, a guard. So he, he is a watchman or a sentinel, you know, a sentinel, a, a Nazarim, a watchman. And by that sense then, because he's blockaded or secluded from society, he then becomes, a, you know, a shepherd, as in a watchman. But also, he becomes a Nazir, meaning he becomes a minister, having subjects under him. So, the concept of Nazir, Nasir, Nazar, Nazarim, Nasar, you know, they all seem to fall in place with the whole ministry of Jesus. Okay, so, however, a Berim publication, and I love a Berim, guys, it takes a whole um, holistic approach to you know, understanding the Hebrew language. So the Abarim publication um, have personalized what they think of the interpretation of uh, Nazareth and this the the Abarim puts forth the argument that it comes from the root word Zara 
you know zara means to scatter or to winnow yields or produces fruit sowing a seed or sperm and then you have netratem meaning to cultivate so it bears the whole concept of producing of being green of being fertile which also goes hand in hand with what we talked about in terms of nazir you see it, it's a concept of productivity greenness you know um um the previous hebraic uh you know interpretation would be you know it has the concept of being located of being green you know of being um fertile also another word that is um persian or iranian um that has to do with the word nasiruta which is a mandian word meaning priestly craft so Yet again, it seems to carry the implication of being consecrated and being a sort of watchman or shepherd or an azir, a minister in that sense. So the concept of Zara, you know, Zara, Nazirim, Nazirtem, uh, seems to carry the implication of being green, of being a shepherd, or being, uh, of, be, of producing uh, fruit, or being fertile, and, um, or being consecrated. Um, but then we move over um, to now now that's that is the Hebrew interpretation of what uh, Nazareth would be now I'm going to move to the more Afro-Asiatic because I'm using the Ekebusi derivation the Ekebusi Hebrew Hebrew language Iboro language to derive where this, uh, where the meaning of Nazareth would come from. Now we have, um, we have in many, I found in many African languages, the consonants S R or Z R, even the Swahili language, tend to imply the concept of a partitioning you know a binary existence or polar existence uh the concept of being secret the concept of being a pillar or a foundation um being lost or dead secret or hidden and or being scattered and dispersed just like it says about being winnowed you know in the in the, in the previous hebrew every language where it talks about zara means to winnow now now for example in the kebusi language where you have sar sar where you have the sara when you have esare means a twin sarange means mid growth like a teenager it's a sarange and usually it's sarange is a name for a girl who's in her adolescent stage, a budding girl. And then you have Omosari is somebody who circumcises. See again the concept of splitting. Um, and then you have Saraga is to cut someone and put in medicine, like the, the, the medicine men would do that, uh, traditional doctors. Uh, and then you have Sarate would be a grazing, you know, camp or field. And then you have Yesire, an axe. An axe bears the concept of splitting again. Now, the concept of being the head or first, Swahili, you have a silly, remember? Now, when you have S, R, or Z, R, you can replace with S, L, or Z, L, because some Bantu languages do not use L, and some do not use R. Like the Ikebusi language does not have L, we have R instead. So, now you have a silly in Swahili, meaning original. Kashira in Japanese language means a boss, okay? Uh, and then you have a pillar of support in the Kagusi language is a siro. Now, in the Kagusi language, being lost or dead is sira. Or sira. Now, secret or hidden in Swahili language is siri. The Yoruba language is shiri. Or shire, closet. Again, being barricaded, being blocked, being besieged, a closet. Uh, and then you have scattered and dispersed. Now you have serera. Now when you're grinding for somebody, you say, eh, serera see, you know, grinding to, to make powder. And then you have obosaro is powdered medicine made from roots that are, you know, taken and burned 
and made into ash and then they grind them and then sieve them and then they I've seen women licking and I've used it before too I mean so Obisaro bears the concept of being round so now this is just the first part of Nisar in terms of the Ikebusi language you just have the basic derivation of it um, however I feel that much of the Hebrew language you know has been diluted or lost in time because scholars especially the western scholars who are predominantly the biblical scholars uh you know the majority of those who uh, you know are propagating the word is western culture have barricaded or besieged <laughs> you know or blocked out you know the african interpretation of the hebrew language you know that way you know the whole concept of whiteness and christianity become one now we've lost you know a wealth of billions of information because we never you know the scholars never include Africa and we also as Africans need to rise up and give you know the true meanings to some of these Hebraic words now I add you that Jesus gave his name in Bethlehem as a Nazarene first and then because Jesus first there was a lot of symbolic uh, you know activities happening during Jesus birth he was born in um, a manger or a you know an, an animal confinement he was born around there but now realize many you know some scholars talk about the fact that oh you know Middle Eastern didn't have inns that's true you know even when you think about Africans the concept of an inn is a very Western kind of thinking again you know it's a very individualistic kind of thinking you know you always had relatives and even sometimes you didn't even have to have relatives you know we're talking strangers you'd be like you know this person's traveling oh let's help them you know you know that whole collectivist cultural thinking but jesus uh, joseph and may had gone to bethlehem for the census so being that he was from that hometown he must have had myriads of family members that he could have um you know stayed with but they say that there was no room in the Cataluma, the guest, the, the the guest room, right? Now, considering that May, having been that she had been in Bethlehem and had time to give birth, had come. Uh, I mean, think about it. If the families are all there, children, you know, children, parents, grandparents. You don't, you know, it would be kind of inappropriate to have, you know, a woman give birth in front of all of these family members. I mean, it only makes sense. That they would use, you know, if there was hardly any room, that they would use the, you know, the animal stable or whatever. Okay. Now, there's something that occurs to me, a very important thing that occurred to me, and it didn't occur to me, I didn't click it together, until I thought about how Africans take care of their animals. Now, we, the Abagusi people, had... Um, grazing camps or grazing fields where you know the the animals because you know people would have like 200 you know cows and 500 goats or whatever you know per you know a, a you know a family you know per extended you know family group however the Abagusi had you know places that they had maybe two miles away three miles away and people would go over there and um and then and, um, let their cattle graze in greener pastures away from the homestead you know sometimes there could even be 10 miles depending you know just contingent on whether you know what available grazing field was there however you know the it was the warriors and the older men who take care of the cattle and they would confine them in fences you know per family or whatever by extended family you know all the cows would stay in one it's called Egesarate one and many Ebisarate. So when you have many grazing camps, the men would sleep there, the old men, you know, the old men and the warriors would sleep there and of course it was a good way for them to bond and get socialized to, you know, societal matters. So, oh, and, and when a woman felt like she needed her husband home, she would make like a sweet dish and then take it over to him in the grazing camp. But the men usually slept there. And it makes sense that the shepherds were watching the flock by night. 
see by the fields at night because it, you know afro asiatic culture is very similar and they had grazing camps where they would watch the flock you know by night or day or whatever but the concept was it was the main fence so it was barricaded and that way it would also prevent you know like the little you know lambs or whatever from straying off and secondly thieves as well because the warriors you don't want to mess with a warrior and his in his cattle like unless you're trying to get killed so they, they had the every day where the men would take the men of the village would take you know the cattle and they would come over there for days on end you know and then come back home and then go back again because you know it's a, it's a basic ag agrarian you know kind of living okay so now when you think about it jesus was taken to a gesarate that, that way would give them privacy and Mary would give back in Egesarate and of course Egesarate would have a manger because the cattle slept in there and so did the men slept in there so they made makeshift houses so Mary was given a makeshift house there together with Joseph so she can deliver in privacy and the next day you know the woman would come and give the food now now when you think about it Jesus case is an exception because usually you know a sarate was a place for men i mean the women would come by you know when they missed their husbands brought over the food you know hung out chill out and then you know the man would later come on home or go home without it i mean just depends on how you know they agreed upon matters but you know at this time when the census were happening in bethlehem um it was not only census that gathered them together, you know, the families in Bethlehem, but it was also during the Feast of the Tabernacle, right? So, I mean, many of the pastures or the grazing fields or the Ebisarate would be deserted, you know, would be, sorry, would be deserted because the shepherds would go home to do the, you know, to do the, the whole you know celebration the high holiday of the feast of tabernacles in fact the feast of tabernacles is one of the highest jewish holidays hebrew holidays jewish um hebrew uh, and and those are two different concepts that i'll talk about later but it, it, the feast of tabernacles was a high holiday you know so the shepherds of course many of them would abandon the field you know so they could go home and, and spend time with their families and a, a few were left because you know the cattle have to be taken care of you don't want to be a victim of theft either so there were a few shepherds that were left during this time you know um uh, during jesus birth so jesus was special in that sense so it, it, it makes sense that you know the 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 the, the grazing camp or the grazing field or stable or whatever you want to call it was appropriate for Jesus back at, at that time because there wouldn't be people near and the shepherds wouldn't be near around there either um so that it makes sense that you know it would be an appropriate place for her to give birth especially because they also had the makeshift hats you know that they made that they made inside these grazing fields now, if you're very familiar with African philosophical and cultural derivations of names, it's pretty simple. It's pretty similar to the Bible. We name based on, so you know, societal manships and occasions and things that happened as well as the living dead, which is something that would be a pagan practice that we adapted later on. However, when you think about it now in the Ekewusi language, if Say, for example, a, a child is born with ears that are, you know, kind of like, kind of like Will Smith, I think of Will Smith, like somebody born with ears that are, you know, kind of cute, big ears, the child will be called Yamato. Or maybe as a child grew up, they, they, the parents noticed that the child had very, you know, like from far, you know, they'd call that child Yamato. Or if a child is born on the road, a road is called Nchera. Enchera, sorry, enchera. So if a child is born, they're called nya nchera. And if a child is born by a water body, water is called amache. So a child will be called nya mache. Now nya is a prefix meaning born of or bearing the attributes of. 
So if you're born by the road, if you're born by Enchera, you're called Nyanchera of the road, right? Or he who has attributes of the road, who he who has attributes that pertain to his ears. So that way you paid attention, if you had somebody who was called Yamato, you paid attention to their ears because the name already tells you, you know, there's something about the ears. So, if somebody is born in Egesarate, they would be called Nyasarate. Right? So, Jesus was called Jesus of Nazareth. Or, to be more authentic, it would be Jesus Nyasarate. He who is born in the cattle camps or the manger or grazing field. Because, and, and how do I even... Um, I found my story further. Okay, remember the angel went over to the shepherds and he told the shepherds, uh, these, uh, you know, the Messiah has been born. Go over there and you'll find a child. Do not be afraid. They're watching their flock by night. Now, it is my thinking that Jesus was born by, or, you know, it's cut in like, um, a grazing field or grazing camp. We don't know what the distance is between, you know, from near Bethlehem, there were shepherds at night, but it was common practice for men to watch their flock, you know, and come together and watch their flock at night, just like it was in Africa. And surprisingly, the Egesarate or Egesarate system was abolished by the Europeans in about the 1913, basically the early 1900s. And this is how they tore down the culture. And you know, it didn't, it didn't really strike me until I was like, oh my God, Jesus was born by the grazing field, Egesarate. So his name was Nyasarate. And now if we go back and look at the definition for the Hebrew Hebrew language, the closest word would be Nasaratem. See that Nasaratem in the Hebrew every language it means to cultivate or green or sown. Now, yes, now when you think about Egesarate, it has basic uh, there's basic concepts behind Egesarate. It has to do with the watchman. Remember when we first talked about this? Let me find it. Uh, when we first talked about the Hebrew every meaning of uh, in, in, uh, Nazareth there was a concept of being consecrated yes the shepherds stayed away from society but they were not cut off uh, number two uh, a fruitful plant with the concept of being a minister now a shepherd is basically the minister of his flock Jesus was a shepherd and then you have the concept of Nazarim a watchman now, a child who is born in Sarate is born in El Sarate. It has a concept of, you know, shepherds and who are Nazarim, the watchmen, to keep guard, to watch. Um, then you have the concept of Nasar, to be fresh, to be bright, grow green. Now, El Sarate were built around green, fertile pastures. Okay, so it, it, it clearly makes sense that Nasar would mean or Nazareth would come from the concept of being green it would come from the concept of meaning to watch to guard it would make sense that um you know the concept of Nazareth would come from the concept of being consecrated to separate oneself but not removing yourself from society like the shepherds would They'd go and camp in the in the cattle camps but they wouldn't remove themselves from society so that when their wives wanted them they would come with food and then men the men would be like bro keep it moving bruh your, your chick is here you know uh, and then it has a concept of being fruitful or being green he has a concept of producing seed. Um, it has a concept of being uh, of being a watchtower or a sentinel or a guard, or and the concept of being uh, Nazarim's watchman, and the concept of being blockaded because Egesarate was blockaded to avoid thieves or to avoid you know the small sheep from straying off or the cattle from straying off, and then. You know, it had the concept of to be bright, to be green, or to grow. And then Abraham says it has to do with the concept of winnowing or scattering. Now, Jesus says he'll come and he'll separate, you know, 
the, the chaff from the wheat, right? And it has a concept of producing fruit uh, or seed or sperm, which is where Jesus was born anyway. So Sarah producing seed, Sarate, the concept of having a barricaded place where the shepherds would sleep for days on end watching their cattle. Nasaraten being cultivated. Nasaraten, Nasarate. See that? And that's how many meanings were lost. You know, primal, fundamental meanings of the Hebrew language for a lot because they totally shut out Africa. But if we go back to the roots, you know, the concept of Sankofa, if we go back to our roots, we'll find out that much of the Hebrew language is an African language. It is an African language. And it's a lingua franca that had so many languages in it. And the Kawusi is one of the progenitor languages. Um, now, in the concept of being secret, you know, the Yoruba, the, the concept of being closeted, uh, Japanese Oshire, uh, the concept of being, you know, guarded or secret, yes, Jesus, now, the second part of Jesus' name, uh, which means that he was growing up in Nazareth. The fundamental reason why he was raised is in Nazareth is so that, you know, Herod's evil progeny would not find him, being that boys were being killed that were around his age. When they, excuse me. When they come from Egypt. So even the concept of being raised in Nazareth was to hide him because it was a predominantly um, um, gentile population so it was basically you know people looked down on Nazareth in a way so people kind of like you know looked at people from Nazareth like y'all sinners you know uh, so the, the concept of being you know separate but being still a part of society still embodies Nazareth okay so Jesus was in Sarate as he was born because he was born in Sarate but then he also went to live in Nazareth because that name still embodied his birth. And so did the coming of the shepherds coming to visit him. I mean, the angel could have gone to anybody. He could have gone to the richest man and told him the Messiah is born. But the angel chose to go to shepherds. You know, just nobodies who we never really hear about, you know. But it was important for the shepherds to come so that they would reaffirm, you know, because this is going to be his clique, you know, um, to reaffirm, you know, that whole concept of Jesus' ministry, being a shepherd, and him being born in a Saturday, you know, he was basically one with them, but, you know, in a more spiritually elevated way. Um, so, even the concept of him being brought up in Nazareth is so that he would be brought up in Sir in Siri, you see that Nazarite, Nazar, Nazarate, Nasiri. So it's the concept of secret and the concept of being barricaded, and the concept of cattle, the concept of watchmen uh, slash shepherds. Uh, because the shepherds, in, in like in my tribe, the warriors, they were trained in warfare, you know, in traditional warfare. So if you try to touch the cattle, they'd spear you or blow gun or whatever they had but you were trying to die if you were trying to steal cattle from a warrior you wanted sure death that's for sure ladies and gentlemen the new meaning then of jesus would be nyasarate so jesus nyasarate of the grazing camp or grazing fields he who is born among cattle so this is how you know you know the basic ideology behind you know an understanding you know the cultural background of this basic bantu languages that make up the hebrew language produces you know meanings that still you know um merge into and form that fabric of the hebrew lingua franca let's think about this logically if we have uh, for for majority of the biblical bullion being you know interpreted by uh westerners i mean think about it if he was called jesus you know 
um, we know, and I mean, anyone who's lived in, in the West, uh, we're highly aware that, you know, Europeans cannot pronounce Nya. They would probably pronounce it as Naya or Ne, right? In the sense that because they don't have A or a leaf like African, the African language does. And then they don't have the Nya, N-Y-A. So if Jesus was Jesus of Nyasarate, it would be Nyasarate or Nyasarate or Nazareth, just like they say it. Nazareth. So now the whole idea of having, you know, Westerners, you know, interpret this very African language, I mean, one can only wonder how many other words have been butchered and killed and put in the casket. You know, and, and this is where that whole concept of, you know, you know, raising is important that we raise people or raise scholars that are of a Bantu, you know, Afro-Asiatic origin to interpret this language because I feel that many of the meanings have been lost or buried or butchered, either or, you know. So it's just like, you know, when you had the influx of Sudanese coming in, um, Sudanese <laughs> coming into, you know, America, you know, the teachers would call, you know, like a girl, she was called Nyajal, they'd say Nyajal or Nyajok, Nyajok. Near jog, so I mean, it to me it just makes perfect sense that his name was Nyasarate, and even if it was written Nyasarate, how could they possibly pronounce Nyasarate, which is pretty close to Nazaratem or Nazarim? It's the same thing, it has a concept of being split, you know, the consonant S R Z R being split, being barricaded, being secret, you know, Jesus was raised in secret, yes, he was, life was barricaded twice when he had to be raised in Egypt, even his whole concept of being raised in Nazareth is an embodiment of his whole secrecy, uh, it, it, you know, he's being read in secret, so, it's, you know, there's a whole foiled, you know, I mean, just from something as simple as, you know, Nazareth, you know, we find the hidden meaning in the Ekewusi language. How many other words can we find in other Bantu languages? I mean, guys, come on. I mean, we need to, like, totally wake up and we need to push our government because now we need to study that Hebrew language from a whole different perspective.